Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming in this afternoon. My name is Eric Gady, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about what authorship means when we think about computing as a medium for thought and how we can find the personal in personal computing when we do so. So let's jump right in. What is it that's personal about personal computing? Is it because you own it? It's not a time-shared system. You have it on your lap or your desktop or in your pocket. Or is it because you can customize it? You can put different fonts. You can put a sticker on your laptop. You can change your background if you want. Or, on the other hand, is it because the person is what is actually the raw material in a surveillance economy? That it is people's minds that are being harvested. Now, all of this is true. All of this are, re is, are reasons that personal computing is personal. But if you're like me, you intuit that there is something else to that. That there is something that has to do with the interaction between a personal computer and some kind of augmentation of your own mind. Now, uh, this wouldn't be a tech talk uh, unless somebody invoked the prophet Steve Jobs. So I'll be the martyr. And I will play a clip of Steve talking about this very issue. I think one of the, the things that really separates us from the high primates is that uh, we're tool builders. And I read a, uh, a study that measured the efficiency of locomotion for various species on the planet. The condor used the least energy to move a kilometer. And uh, humans came in uh, with a rather unimpressive showing about a third of the way down the list. It was not not uh, too proud of a showing for the crown of creation. So uh, that didn't look so good. But then somebody at Scientific American had the insight to test the efficiency of locomotion for a man on a bicycle. And a man on a bicycle, or a human on a bicycle, blew the condor away, completely off the top of the charts. And that's what a computer is to me. Uh, what a computer is to me is it's the most remarkable tool that we've ever come up with. And it's the equivalent of a bicycle for our minds. So this is the famous bicycle for the mind analogy. And this is really good marketing. Because at first, at first blush, this sounds like it's saying something significant. But if you dig into it a little bit more, you run into some interesting problems. So here, the analogy he's making is between energy efficiency. What is energy efficient about your mind from the computer? Is that what he's talking about? Probably not. Is he talking about thinking more efficiency, efficiently? Is thinking more efficiently thinking better? If you've had a thought in the shower, you probably think probably not. Um, so what I interpret from this is something that's even a little shallower than that, and that he's simply paying reference to this general cultural value of efficiency as a good for its own sake. And that kind of comes from more contemporary economic thinking throughout society. And it's associated with productivity, specifically industrial kinds of productivity. And that is a lot of what computing has become to be associated with. There's this idea that computing is a new kind of industrial revolution for the mind. Um, I think that this is a bad analogy. It's bad because, first of all, it's not borne out in the economics, the productivity part. And second, because it doesn't lead us anywhere. It only gets us to today. So if we toss this aside, what are we left with? We have some nebulous concept of intelligence augmentation. Well, there is another technology that we can make an analogy to. It's one that is old, very well attested, uh, and has had massive civilization changing effects. It's one that we all interact with on a daily basis without even really realizing it most of the time, that's reading and writing, literacy. And taking this perspective is not something I'm thinking of originally. A lot of the pioneers of personal computing 40 and 50 years ago were thinking very deeply about a literacy analogy when it came to the medium. But I want to be plain about what I'm suggesting from here on out, and that is that I think that we have a lot to gain by using an analogy of literacy to say that computing as a medium can give us new intellectual capabilities the same way literacy did before it. So let's dig into this literacy analogy. Have a look at this slide. 
Now, I can't say what you were thinking when you read this, but I can say with reasonable certainty what you weren't thinking. You were not looking at each of these glyphs and decoding it into its English phoneme, its sound in the language. You weren't even sounding out words. I'm willing to bet you weren't thinking about grammar or syntax or even where that line broke. Right? What you were doing was thinking up here. You were in this mental space purely of ideas. Right? And you don't remember it, but it took you a lot of work to get there. So you broke through a threshold of literacy. And once you did that, there was no going back. And this is really significant. This is the big idea of literacy, that there's a new mental space in which you can interrogate your own ideas. So there's a cycle to this that makes it important, right? You think of something, you can write it down, you can read it. This is St. Augustine notably reading quietly, very personal activity, uncommon in his time. Just like you guys, I didn't hear a lot of sound when you were reading that last slide. Okay, so what do we get from all this? Well, it turns out it's the basis for everything, philosophy, science, mathematics. Everything is built upon this foundation. It is impossible to think of it if you have not broken through that threshold. It is a new kind of thought entirely. Now, I'm going to take a different angle looking at this analogy and talk about the origins of writing. So writing appears independently in at least three places that we know about, but I'm going to look at the oldest. So the oldest writing system comes from ancient Sumer, it's in modern day Iraq. It's called cuneiform, which means wedge-shaped, and it involves taking a stylus and pressing it into clay tablets to make shapes. So the earliest attested cuneiform comes from about 3200 BCE. For those of you who aren't savvy with the history, that's over 5,000 years ago. Um, and the form here is one of basic accounting. So there's not really words here, it's more pictographic. And there are things like heads and jugs and then dots, and that's saying, how many jugs of beer do these heads get for working? Because you got paid in beer, which was nice. <laughs> so let's fast forward a thousand years or more, and we're at the old Babylonian period. Aha, things have gotten more interesting. The writing system's more comprehensive. Um, in this script, there is a horrible mixture <laughs> of syllabograms, that is, uh, signs that have a sound value, uh, pictograms, like in the original proto form, and then ideograms, which are symbols that actually do mean a particular word in a language. And they are used in a highly ambiguous way. Right? This is a very complicated writing system. But now it's spreading everywhere. That is a uh, stella of the laws of Hammurabi, so that's how far you know that they're getting with this. And then in the most contemporary period we'll look at, we have the Neo-Assyrian. And so by 600 BC, what's happened is some of these forms have simplified. But the core of the writing system is still just this complicated jumble mess. It's still syllabograms and ideograms and logograms all mixed together ambiguously. What's most important is that throughout this entire period, as writing is spreading everywhere, it is almost the per exclusive purview of a class of people called scribes. They have near total domain over this knowledge. OK, so why am I bringing any of this up? The amount of time between that first tablet and that last tablet is 2,500 years. Whole cities and cultures and empires rise and fall during that time period. A lot happens. But the basics, after a certain point, don't change. Things are still complicated. All right, well then how do we get here? How do we get to mass literacy? There's a bunch of things you need. The book's a good idea. Why don't we have a codex? Why don't we have pages so we can hold more writing? We can index the pages. It's portable. Uh, why don't we slap this on it? This will give us a standardized way of reading, and more importantly, it'll be able to mass produce identical texts for everybody. And even more importantly, not to be underestimated, is a much simpler writing system. Here I'm using the alphabet just as an example. There are other simpler writing systems in the world, like the Korean. Um, but yeah, let's take. 20-something glyphs, attach them to sounds, that's all anybody needs to know. And then, by far the most important factor, you have an institutional and social commitment to having everyone in your society break through that threshold. And once you do that, you have a literate society. Now, 
I think that we don't have anything like mass literacy in computing today, not even close. I would argue that most of us at this conference, myself included, we are the scribes. We are in a scribal computing culture. So as my examples here, I have the guys inventing Unix on the PDP. Their primary input and output there is a teletype. That's a close-up of a teletype command line output. That's about 1972. 50 years later, there's my terminal emulator. And the forms have gotten a little simpler. I got color and stuff. But what is it emulating? It's emulating that teletype. And what's worse, it's running a Unix. So why am I bringing this up? A lot happens in the world in 50 years, right? A lot has happened in computing. It's spread all over the place, just like writing spread all over the place in the cuneiform era. But the form hasn't really changed that much. It is conducive to a scribal culture. And computing is also scribal in an even more important way, and that's that there is a strong and, I think, uh, completely unnecessary bifurcation between programmers and users. So in that sense, we make these systems as black boxes, we give them to people, and then they can interpret them as magic. They can make of them whatever they want, because they don't even have the tools to understand what this is. And that is because we don't give them the medium to do so. So you might think, OK, whatever. You know, our computers are really powerful. I'll turbocharge this thing to like 4.8 gigahertz, do some machine learning. This will all be great. But the problem is, uh, we aren't thinking anew. As Einstein said, we cannot solve problems with the same thinking that produced them. Uh, the key to doing this is to have thinking, using the computing medium, become more personalized. So if we look at what happens with math, for example, you know, you needed writing and literacy, conventional literacy, to, uh, they were sufficient but not enough to bring about uh, a mathematical language that we have today. And um, the thing about this is that computing is not a new language in an older medium. It's a new medium itself. So if we're going to do a new kind of mathematics, uh, we need some kind of new system for doing so. We don't want to uh, be running math in our teletype environments. So you know, we need new ways to represent these things, right? And then to think about them, and then we're on our way to the future. So where does all this get us? I think the best thing to do is to condense the actual question that we have into the simplest possible phrasing. And the one I like the best comes from Andy DeSessa in the opening paragraph of his book, Changing Minds. And he asks, can computers convey to humans a new increment of intellectual power that rivals what conventional literacy has given us? That's the core question. So what does that mean for personal authorship? Well, I'm sorry, but I can't give you a definition of authorship. But what I can say is that it is the exploration in this context of the following two questions. What does it mean to read in the medium of computing? And what does it mean to write in the medium of computing? And are those the same thing or not? So I want to look at some historical examples here of what we think was going in a good direction for authorship. And the first system I want to highlight is Hi HyperCard. So HyperCard was created at Apple. Whoops. HyperCard was created at Apple by Bill Atkinson in 1987. And what it was is a kind of software erector set where you got uh, a bunch of different pieces, objects like buttons and fields and things. And they would go on the central metaphor that was used here, which was stacks and cards. So an application in the hypercard sense was a stack. A stack of cards. Each card was a view. You could put buttons on it, fields, images, paint. Um, and it fit very cleanly into the Mac operating system at the time. All of those objects could be opened up and inspected. You could see how they worked on the inside by doing a special kind of click. Um, and under that click was a scripting language that was highly readable called HyperTalk. Uh, HyperTalk was written to be kind of like natural English, uh, but the most important aspect of it from our point of view is that it was easier to read than it was to write. To us, that's essential for exploration uh, for people coming in from the outside. 
They don't need to know everything, they just need to maybe understand how one thing works. HyperCard also shipped free with every Macintosh for years. Uh, to the point where, by the mid-90s, we have conflicting numbers about this from people we've spoken with, but there's something, somewhere between four and six million stack authors. I think that's remarkable, particularly if you, if any of you were around at the time, know how many people were actually Mac owners in the early 90s. The other system I want to point to is Smalltalk. So for those who don't know, Smalltalk is a pure object-oriented language and environment in one. This was the legendary system that was developed at the Xerox PARC Learning Research Group starting in 1982. This is the group that was headed by uh, Alan Kay. And uh, the central metaphor here is that you only have these elementary computing objects and the only thing that happens in a system is that they send or receive messages. Your job is to configure the system to send certain messages. You can define how objects behave when they get the message. It had all these things we like today, live debugging, you program it while it runs, and much like HyperCard, everything can be popped open and inspected on a whim. Uh, it had, very importantly, because it was an environment and a language, it had a minimal set of lang linguistic concepts, minimal syntax, because most of everything that happened occurred in this environment. Um, and I think this is probably the most important aspect of this. The system was designed and experimented initially on children. So what was happening here was that this team knew that personal computing was going to go out into the world. They thought in about five to ten years. And they said that they wanted to explore what the mode of interaction would be like. They did not have in mind a strict separation between users and programmers. So they wanted to know what's the easiest way that we can get people to actually do computing. And that's why they started with children, but they always said children of all ages because they figured the systems that went out into the world would eventually be just as applicable to uh, adults. And Diana Mary, who was one of the programmers uh, on the small talk system when we spoke to her, said, mentioned to us rather interestingly that uh, in that group, Marshall McLuhan was required reading. So they were very steeped in this, this sort of media criticism and literary studies uh, when they came up with these systems. So, what are the main takeaways from these examples? This is a big one for us. We don't care so much about languages if you consider them independently of the environments in which they operate and in which people use them. But from our perspective, the most important concept might be, in computing, might be the use of metaphor. If you have good metaphors, you're going to have a system that is very rich and highly usable and conducive to being manipulated by all kinds of people. And then there's a third aspect here, which is what Adele Goldberg, who was a member of the, that research group at Xerox PARC, uh, calls the onion. She literally wrote the book on small talk, by the way. She's the author. Uh, and what she means here in this quote is that when you are using a system, and you get to a point where you need to do something that you just quite can't do at this layer, you should be able to just peel back a little bit and see one layer down about how it's working and what's going on. And you should be able, as you use a system that is yours, that is personal, continuously peel back layers all the way down. So last year I was in a very fortunate position to work with two longtime collaborators in a uh, lab environment. And we were basically told we could work on whatever we wanted. So we wanted to pull from these, this uh, literacy analogy and discuss how we would design our, basically our ideal computing system from the ground up. What might be involved? What are the big, uh, what's like the framework we would use? Uh, and so to start with, we thought these two ideas are great. The onion idea and the metaphor idea are great and maybe we can combine them. And early on, what we came up with was this very vague sketch <laughs> of what the system would be like, but I think it's important, so I'm going to explain it to you a little bit here. You can have layers of metaphor. So you can have different layers that are themselves a consistent metaphor, universe of metaphor, that can then be used to describe the next layer above it. So at the bottom here, we had this idea of uh, actors 
and not just in the Carl Hewitt sense, but the entire hardware would be abstracted by uh, stage play metaphor. So, you know, stage manager takes care of your memory, the director runs instructions on a core. Um, and that could be used to describe some kind of UI metaphor that we were going to describe. And then you could go to something that's hypercard-like above that, right? Stacks and cards. And then eventually you get to your desktop environment. And what that means, of course, is when the, the entry point for someone buying a computer or using one is that desktop environment. Now they can peel down. Oh, how does my desktop, how does the close button in my finder work? Well, I'll just peel down and it looks like it's some hypercard-like stack thing or something. Go down all the way to the bottom if you want to. Uh, as with research projects, we figured we probably only had three to six months funding. So what could we, what's the biggest piece we could uh, chew here? And we decided to go for this layer. And what we ended up creating uh, is a system that we very cleverly call Simple Talk. And it is a web based system for now. And uh, there's a couple caveats here. It's, it's, it's experimental. And we don't think, I'm not saying in any way that this is the solution to all the problems I was highlighting earlier. This is just one attempt at exploring the ideas. So I'm going to describe a little bit of, about that to you now. Um, some of you might have guessed uh, this. You've been in Simple Talk the whole time. So this presentation is in the browser. This is a Simple Talk world, as we call it. And there's, uh, there's my presentation stack and all my cards down here in this navigator. Um, and so we use this spatial metaphor. We thought it's a good one. Cards and stacks is really intuitive. Um, and the Simple Talk system is made up of what we call parts. Uh, these are active uh, dynamic entities that are the core of the system. They're sort of a vocabulary of things that you use when constructing things in the system. And the other spatial metaphors that we have in these parts is we have windows and we have these generic areas for containing uh, other parts. And of course we have parts for doing things, the most exciting kind. Audio, images, drawings, video, uh, text fields, and of course, buttons. And just like in Hypercard or in Smalltalk, you can pop open this button and you can see the script that runs that and you can change it if you want. So these are live objects that people are familiar with. It is a lexicon that people already know. And that's what one aspect that we thought was very important about it. Oops. Sorry, my mouse isn't working. OK. And we also have the metaphor of communication. That's message sending and passing. All of the parts communicate by sending and receiving messages. When you script in our scripting language, you are simply describing what happens when a certain message is received. Now, importantly, all of our parts have what we call properties. They are reactive aspects of each object that, uh, that you can change using scripting, and that can be changed as a result of sending messages. So for example, here I have an audio, and I can play it. and what will happen is the property change message will automatically be sent. And if there's something there uh, on my button, uh, it will change the play state. And you can see that this audio changes the button activation state as well. This is simple communication of properties and messages between these parts. The other thing is that we think this is fairly readable as well. And as you can tell, it's, it, it, for those of you who know, it is uh, inspired by HyperTalk. And the final thing is that there is nothing sacred here. Everything in the system is made up of these parts. So the editor you saw with the script in it, it's just a field with a button and a window. There's nothing special about it. It sends a message to the system when you're compiling a script. We can save a script here, and now this button will say hello. And if you know, I can change the save button so that it makes this the uh, object that it's targeting do a spin or whatever I want. It's a silly example, but. And you can also change the editor itself. You can have it flash when you type, right? Because it's simply just changing these properties under the hood every time a new character is put in. 
Uh, and the key concept here is that there's a special property that's called the target. So any part can have another, uh, a reference to another part as its target property. And that's what's happening here when we compile this script. We're saying, take what's in this field, make it the script of that button, and while you're at it, spin it around. So that's a summary of the basics of this simple talk system and, and how we've been using the onion and the central concept of metaphor. So we have our world stacks and cards. Our communication metaphor uses what we think are these clear relationships, messaging, natural language in this case, which is readable. We use the current vocabulary of computing that everybody knows, buttons, browsers, fields, and it's the beginning of this onion peeling process. So I'm just going to wrap up here, and in doing so, I want to say that the shallow analogies have real corrosive uh, effects in the world, real consequences. And we think that bad metaphors can lead us astray. I don't think it's a coincidence that when the thinking about personal computing switched from being about books to being about bicycles, that we saw a seemingly endless amount of energy and resources, intelligence and imagination being poured into environments of highly dubious social value. And I think we need to take this authorship idea seriously. And if we are going to be serious about it and recognize our scribal position, right, we need to build systems that people can change in, in a sense of authorship and not just systems that change people. Uh, and so if you are interested in m learning more about Simple Talk, we have a, uh, a home stack running at this site, uh, along with um, a description of the parts and, and, and utilities like that. There's the uh, repository link. These are my collaborators. Special thank you to uh, Daniel Krasner and Thomas Nyberg. And um, I have time for questions, if anyone has any. Thank you. Yeah, so l let me see if I can summarize the question for the stream. Uh, is, are there, is, the, is there enough of a ratio of people who are just content consumers rather than content creators to justify building these kind of authorships? Is that a fair description? Um, I'll give you an example that we use frequently. Uh, in the Mac operating system today, uh, any user goes and they know what a button is. They're all over the place. What do you do with the button? You click it. Now tell them to make a button. There is nothing in between for them. The only thing you can do is download Swift and Xcode and learn a full programming language. There's nothing in between. There's a second part of my answer to your question, which is that we set the culture. If people don't feel like they want to do something, maybe it's because they don't even know that's possible. And they're, let me go back here, they're the people in this slide, right? They don't know what's pop, they don't know anything about this. We're not helping them. So I do think that there is space for it. I think that those early examples are really attest to the fact that there is. It's just that something got off the rails here, right? There were different motivations uh, at play, I think. Well, the example I always use is the finder, right? I think that's the entry, or the entry level for, for people. You should also really be able to take in your web browser, take the items that are buttons or whatever that's on someone's site and just rip it out and put it on your desktop. There's really no reason you shouldn't be able to do it. You should have a system that allows you to do that. Um, Web browsers are complicated, though. But I would say I would start with something simple like the Finder, because that is the entry point for people when they're using a, a operating system. Right. No, we don't. We don't have that. We don't have separate levels. So there's not. You can't, for example, lock a stack so that it's only readable, and you can't. You know, this hyper. What he's paying reference to is that hypercard used to have authorship levels, uh, one to five. There was people who were like readers, and you couldn't open up a button and edit a script or anything. Um, and then there was five, which was the most uh, authoritative, and you could basically do anything. But we don't, we don't have uh, any restrictions like that, no. Yeah, so the question is, um, 
the gentleman here works with children and he says that they are you know, actively using programs like Minecraft and Roblox and they're being very creative and dynamic with their, with their medium and what do I make of that? I think that the video game people have been ahead of everybody else for a very long time, even in the way they make the games. Right? This is a highly interactive experience for making games. If you, if you, I don't know a lot about making games, but I've seen people use Unity. It's fascinating. Uh, for people who do other kinds of software development, we're nowhere near that. Sitting here in our terminals. Scratch is, I think Scratch is wonderful. Um, one of the things, and this is also a problem that some of the small talks have currently, is that it doesn't look like the real thing. An advantage of HyperCard in its prime was that it looked exactly like the real thing. It was not different. And I remember from when I was younger, and maybe some of you have a similar experience, you want to make the real thing. You don't want some bootleg copy. Even today, you know, if you use like uh, GTK or QT or something, you're like, ah, oh, it's not quite there. It kind of looks funny. Um, and I think that actually goes a long way. Uh, in terms of the, I'm not super familiar with a lot of the low, low code solutions today, um, but I think that certainly is a step in the right direction. The question is, is there important to make a distinction between web things and desktop things, native applications? Um, that's a tough one. In, <laughs> if we're still in my ideal universe, I would throw away web browsers entirely and just get, get rid of the web. Uh, I think it is, uh, <laughs> it is become a, too big of a pile of ideas that are not well organized and I think don't have good metaphors. Not good metaphors there. If there was a good document metaphor, it has jumped the shark a long time ago. You know, I, I know that there's a lot of push towards, you know, the web is the operating system. The reason we wrote this in a web browser is because I, you know, I, I was gonna do it in a small talk, but it's a big ask to have someone download a virtual machine when they already have one running on their computer. And that may sound like I did it out of convenience, but I'm doing it out of what I think is uh, a setback. That is a setback. Yeah, so the question is a lot of programming is done in Excel. Is that different from this or is that a springboard into something else? I love Excel, I love spreadsheets. It's definitely the most widely used programming environment in the world as far as I can tell. Um, and that, that also has a very good kinesthetic and visual metaphor for what it's dealing with. And in fact, one of the elementary parts we were gonna build in in the next round, if we ever got to it, was going to be a basic sheet part that then you could map to other things if you were so inclined. Um, yeah, I don't know, I'm not sure how much else to say about that. Spreadsheets are incredibly powerful and I tend to not like when you hear some software engineers kind of, you know, turning down their nose at it, what regular people are doing with spreadsheets. Yes? So the question is about Emacs. Emacs is one of these highly malleable environments. What lessons would I learn from Emacs? What would I take away from that? Um, this is my Emacs. Uh, <laughs> uh, very highly customized Emacs. I, I uh, go down that rabbit hole. But the, the, so yes, Emacs is wonderful. I love Emacs. It doesn't have the layers. We need to have the layers. I think a real crucial part of this is the metaphor layers that are self-consistent and can be used to describe the ones above them. That is how you peel back the onion. That's what we were thinking anyways. Oof, man, there's a, the question is um, hypercard, small talk, debatably, and Visual Basic failed, uh, what lessons can we take about this whole concept? Um, there's a really mealy-mouthed answer I could give, but maybe not so much of computing should be tied to making short-term profits. I think that would go a long way. Uh, you know, this kind of thing is inherently not profitable. If you're gonna give someone the ability to make a bunch of stuff, who's gonna make money? Now, I think there's, a, there's several reasons that Apple let HyperCard die on the vine, mostly because they didn't know what to do with it. They've done the same thing with AppleScript, but Apple's a trillion dollar company. They're a trillion dollar, what are they working on? 
Shame on them. They're making TV shows and credit cards. What's going on? They have all the resources and all the intelligence. What's happening? Are they going to try? So I don't know. I, 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 think, I think you would have to, you know, you have to make big changes. This is all about embedded in larger social changes. Yeah, so the question is about even this is working with the bread and butter physical interfaces of classical computing, keyboards, screens, two dimensions, um, and is that going to work for this kind of thing going forward? Uh, I'm going to do the easy thing and I'm going to pass that on to Brett Victor because I think Dynamic Land is a really good exploration of that. And his writing about the use of hands on his website, I think everybody should read. I think there's a whole kinesthetic component to all of this that's, that's vastly underrated. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, Swift Playgrounds on the tablets. I mean, if you want to learn programming the way it's done today, I think that uh, seems fantastic to me. It's a great new way to learn cuneiform, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> right. So let me try to summarize that in the, in the, for the stream. The question is, Alan Kay had the research project 10 years ago at Viewpoints, which was uh, Steps Towards the Future of Programming, NSF-funded uh, project. And they had basically come up with making a bunch of small DSLs for different layers of this part of the thing. And the question is, would Simple Talk be something like that, or would it be more like Emacs, where it's a pile of, of, of ELIS? Well, the first thing I want to say before I answer that directly is that the, uh, the peg that we use for the scripting language is ohm.js, which comes directly out of the work from Steps and later uh, Hark that was at Y Combinator. So we found that really useful. So yeah, we're, we read a lot of the steps papers, and that was like highly influential. What uh, we were envisioning for, oh, where am I here? Hold on, guys, I have a navigator. What we were envisioning for a simple talk was that we were just really experimenting only with one part of this layer here. So it wasn't going to be a pile of simple talk scripting language all the way down. There would be a different, yeah, what you would maybe call a DSL for each layer. So these actors, there would be some language in which you would configure the actors and tell them how to communicate with each other at the bottom and then the UI would be described in terms of them and so on and, and, and so forth. But you know, we didn't know, we didn't get a chance to, to do any of that part of it. I think that, that's a really rich environment for experimenting with things because then you know, what works and what doesn't when you're going between these layers, right? Yeah, I think that's very interesting. Um, are we at time? Does anybody know? Do we need to go? Okay. Well, thank you all. If you have any more questions, I'll be around, and you can post them in the Slack, of course. Uh, so thank you for coming out.